The lens of the camera has the superpower to connect the past to the present. And it also makes the moment last forever in the future. Dear viewers, I hope you're doing well. Today we're having with us a special guest, a beautiful mind. She came from far, far away. <laughs> so it's a beautiful talent, it's a beautiful mind. Miss Laurence Mathieu. Hi, thanks for having me. Welcome to Algeria. Thank you. Welcome to the Knowledge Channel. Thank you. So, you came from Canada. How are you? Tell, tell us more about you. The audience wants to discover you. Um, so, thanks for having me. I am from Montreal, Canada. I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I started off as a journalist. Uh, I worked for primarily American news organizations for the past 12 years. Um, I worked for uh, in New York City and then after the, the elections of Donald Trump in 2016, which I had covered for The Guardian, a uh, big English news organization, um, but I was based in New York. I decided to leave the world of journalism to become a full-time documentary filmmaker. To tell stories that deserve to be told. Yeah, I mean, I had always told stories that deserve to be told. That was part of my job as a journalist. Um, I did produce documentaries as part of my work as a journalist. It was short, short form. Um, so I was a, already a filmmaker. But I think I wanted to be able to tell the stories I wanted to tell the way I want to tell them. Journalism is still a place where you have to follow specific rules and um, you can't have your opinion in there. Documentary is more um, free form yes. and uh, you can have a more humanistic approach. And so that's the direction I wanted to go into. I wanted to tell stories the way I wanted to tell them. And What's the difference between making a documentary as a journalist and as a freelance? I mean, I mean, the main thing also is when you're making feature length documentary, which means you're going into longer form, um, it takes a lot more preparation. Usually when you're a journalist, you follow the news, you follow the story of the day, uh, or you're usually telling something, if it's more like an evergreen story, it'll still be in the context of what's happening right now in the world. Um, documentary could take uh, many years to make if you're doing a feature-length documentary. So you're, you're already working um, with a different time frame. Um, and then, you know, you're just more in control of, of the topic your own story uh, when you're not doing it in the context of journalism. Um, and then again, you know, you'll still produce it. You're hoping that your film will end up on television or on the screen. So the work is still to make a story that people want to watch and be interested in. And you're hoping to touch their heart and help them learn something. If, if, if only one person watches your documentary and it will touch their soul and their heart, it could be considered as a success. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully you want more than one person to see yes. your work. No. Uh, but the goal is that, depending on what kind of documentary films you're making, because there's so many different types, um, the goal is that you could share your work with others and that you hope that they will be moved and interested in by what you do. So one person, a million, per a million people, uh, I hope more like a million people than one. <laughs> So. We hope so. Yes. So your documentary is about Willie or we? Right. So uh, I made a film called Willie that's currently uh, screening here in Alger. Um, it tells the international festival of Algiers. Correct at at Fika. Um, so I'm very thankful to be here and able to share my work. Um, the movie is a 90-minute film that tells the story of Willie or we was the first black hockey player in the National Hockey League, which is um, North American Hockey League. In uh, US and Canada, hockey is a major sport. It's, um, I would argue, more popular than football. Uh, and it is a, um, so Willie is really a man who changed history and his, uh, his legacy is still remembered today. And so I made a, a film about him. He made his way through all the, 
a hard way. Enormous amounts of adversity, you know, historically in America, there's um, a long heritage of, of racial tension that is a direct heritage of... Hatred. Well, it's a direct heritage of the story of slavery and the way American, the American country was built. Um, and, you know, in the early 1900s, all the way through the 60s, uh, there were many states in the United States that had a uh, Jim Crow law, which was um, basically codified racism um, that allowed, you know, politicians and police officers to mistreat uh, people of color in the United States. And so, Willie O'Ree broke the color barrier in the late 50s, and so he had to face all of that um, and more. So the fact that he was able to play um, a hockey game while there was no other pe black people in the league was extraordinary, and so he had to break many barriers to get there. the first one. It's always hard to be the first one. He made history. Um, he made history. He made history, and then he opened doors for many people. Um, and he's still living today, so the story is not just about the past, it's about the present. So you met him. Right, um, yeah, well, so... <laughs> making this documentary, I bet it has been an amazing journey. It was an extraordinary journey because he is a phenomenal, beautiful person. Tell us everything from the beginning. <laughs> Um, how it all started is that um, I used to live in Harlem, which is a historically um, black neighborhood in, in uh, northern Manhattan in New York City. And uh, my neighbor, who had been the first black executive at the National Hockey League, uh, was also a friend of mine. And one day we just had a talk on the stoop of our brownstone, and he basically told me about Willie's story, and I was surprised that I had never heard about him. And um, having grown up in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, which is a town, a hockey town, I thought it was a shame that we didn't learn about that story. And so Brian, my neighbor, and I decided that we were going to make a film about Willie. And uh, from that point on, we just uh, started filming really quickly. We had access because he had worked at the National Hockey League and knew Willie. Uh, we raised money quickly, and um, me, I also do camera, so I didn't have to wait to hire a crew. We just got together, started filming, and Willie got on board with it. You know, he was already like 82 years old at the time, uh, but he was still working. Uh, he was still traveling the country because he, since, you know, breaking the color barrier, he had done a lot of different things, but in the 90s, he had been rehired at the National Hockey League to do impact work with young people. And so I ended up following him around the country, both in Canada and in the U.S., doing his work, and ultimately followed him uh, into the moment he was um, uh, brought into the, um, the Hockey Hall of Fame. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. And how did it take you? How many time did you did long the making of the movie? Normally, a documentary film of that magnitude, if you talk about feature-length documentary, it could take many years. 90 minutes. Um, a 90-minute film. But because we were working in a specific time frame, uh, we started filming in 2018, and then he, was in, in, uh, he came into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2019, uh, we wanted to get the film out really quickly. There was a lot of uh, tension in the United States at that time, and also in Canada, that had that was sort of like a consequence of the election of Donald Trump, and we felt like Willie's story was really inspiring. Uh, it was a story of perseverance, um, also like highlighting the importance of diversity in sports, but also in society, and why it's important to be allies and stand together against racism and for social justice. And so we, we shot and edited the film at the same time, and we made it in a year, which is, year. Which is very fast in documentary world standards. That's, yes. That's really fast mm -hmm. for 90 minutes. Yes, it was. Including the, the writing, the movie editing, everything. Everything. We, uh, we were shooting and editing at the same time. Yes. Uh, and that's why... It went so fast. But, you know, if I put it in context, I'm working on a documentary series I've been working on for seven years. And so sometimes it could take longer, sometimes it goes faster. It just depends on the timing and when you want it out and when it makes sense to put it out. Was it easy to find people who could witness about Willie, to talk about Willie? It was extremely easy. First of all, I mean, hockey is a major sport. 
you know, if I compare it to like a level of popularity, it would be like football here, right? That's uh, it's called football, not soccer. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I agree with you. Yes. I'm, a, I'm a little bit European, so, and Algerian also, so it's okay. But, um, but you know, and also the fact that uh, he had a story that was part of history. He's like the Jackie Robinson of hockey. Jackie Robinson was the first baseball player to break the color barrier in the, yes. in the uh, major baseball league. And so... Um, as soon as the project started, we got a lot of attention. Um, and once the film was finished, we, we made it independently because oftentimes you will want to have a broadcaster uh, with you from the get-go, but we decided we were going to be independent and go the festival route. Uh, and then, you know, as soon as the film started going rounds and festivals, um, we got a call from Disney that, and then decided to give us the first window. So that was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. What about the archive images? So the film has enormous amounts of archives, uh, which are really beautiful. Um, a lot of them were donated to us directly by the National Hockey League, which was spectacular. Archival in any film, any documentary film can be very expensive. So we were very fortunate to collaborate with the National Hockey League. And then in making the film, we also ended up, um, we ended up finding uh, wheels of wheels of Super 8 film that were back in the town, his hometown, Willie's hometown. Uh, so that added a different dimension to the film because we were able to show footage from like the 60s and the 70s and even from when he was a child. So it made the film really beautiful and, um, and unique. And while you were shooting the, the film, there were a lot of racial tensions. There was enormous amount of racial tension in the U.S. Uh, and that's, that's always, to be honest. Uh, with the rise of the use of social media, more people are able to share stories of, for example, police brutality or, um, or any situation that will, they will encounter, they can share on social media. So I think there's uh, more and more awareness about, you know, um, discrimination in the United States. Now, in 2020, we saw what happened with George Floyd, uh, and that became like a nas an international story. Um, and also created a moment, because it's not just in the United States. Racism is not something that's only in the United States. Everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. And so the importance is to share stories to help build allyship, um, because, you know, everyone loses when in situations of discrimination it's not it, you know so we, we need to like stand up together and raise our voices and and making the film was part of that effort uh, because in the film we showcase the importance of friendship and allyship and that um, people who stood behind Willie were not just people of color they're people of all all colors yes. <laughs> and that's the beauty of the story is that um, you know when when we rise we rise together Willie said it doesn't matter if I am black or pink or any other color? Well, you know, I think, I think Willie doesn't want to remember the hardship. You know, it was hard for, for him to get it out that he had actually faced a lot of hardship and, and, and um, racism. Um, but ultimately, that trauma is part of his story. And, and the takeaway is that, um, especially for him, because he's such an elegant man, um, that don't let this bring you down and it doesn't matter those who want to be ignorant they can be ignorant and he he's going to share you know um the the fruit of his legacy with everybody who wants to listen and grow with him and help move society forward so that was the overarching message and i think it's a beautiful one and the beautiful coincidence is that your documentary is airing here in algiers at the fika international festival of algiers 2022. At the same time, there is the World Cup of Football 2022. Canada took part in this World Cup, and the first goal scored by Canada in history of World Cup has been scored by Alfonso Davies. Canadian, a Canadian, Canadian, a black Canadian. Black Canadian. That's a beautiful coincidence. I, you know, I think Canada, and people need to always remember that, like Canada is just a, a land of immigrants, really. I mean, the first, the first Nations are the true people of Canada, if we think about it, indigenous people. And then, um, especially where I come from, for example, 
everyone is a little bit of something. You know, my mother is French Canadian, my father is French and Algerian yes. <laughs> um, and Spanish to some capacity, you know. So I think in remembering that, we have to always honor the fact that anyone who lives in Canada at this stage is Canadian no matter what their color is and that we're all equal because we all came from somewhere else and that's what makes the beauty of it. And according to some reports, hatred and madness are increasing all around, all around the world. And the, one of the best ways to heal the world is the art therapy. What you're make, making a movie is art. So according to you, how can a movie, how can you heal the world through your lens? Well, I mean, that's a really big question. I think there's definitely a rise in um, right-wing politics all around the world, which creates this sentiment that everyone's moving right and there's like a rise in tension. I think on the ground, though, the reality is that people, most people, would rather live in peace uh, in a world where they can um, celebrate each other and just be happy. Uh, but but I, I think, um, and again, I'm not an expert at this, but I do think because we have social media, because, you know, we have or the internet and we can see content from all over the world, it's important as a filmmaker for me to share stories that will be able to move everybody. Now, Willie's story is about hockey, and maybe hockey, again, is not a sport that is played in Algeria. But um, I think if you watch the film, you'll feel connected to the main character only maybe for his own fight to, to, to have a place in his community, to have a place in his sport. Um, the fact that it's a sports story usually moves people because sport is universal. And you, Same here in, in Algeria, during right. the Algerian Revolution, mm -hmm. we had a football team called the National Liberation Front football team. Right. And there are really beautiful stories. Exactly. And, and, and I think there's always beautiful stories around sports because sports is a place where people meet. There's always people of different ethnicities on the team, but in, you share the, the fact that you're all from the same country. And um, it's a place where you break barriers. And, and once then also- they, Once they wear the same jersey, they are all playing for the same flag. Exactly. And then, and then you have a platform, which is what's important. Great. So please tell us more about your further projects. So um, I do a lot of different things. Uh, I am a director and producer for an investigative TV show in Canada. Um, and then I've been working on several documentary projects. Uh, but my main project right now is called uh, I Am Tyra. It's following the, the story of a woman who was in prison for 23 years, but had a story of innocence. And so the series kind of, I started filming while she was in prison and she's since come out of prison. And um, it's really a story about um, the reality of women who experience incarceration. And it's in the context of mass incarceration in the United States, which incarcerates the most women on earth. Um, really? Yeah. That's so that's, uh, that's my, my next big project. That's sad. It's a reality. I mean, the United States has over 2 million people incarcerated. And, you know, I'm Canadian, but I'm also American, so I do a lot of stuff on both sides of the border. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And how was the, the, the entire journey from journalism to creating and making documentaries to... How do you choose your topics, your stories? I think that's always a good question. Um, you know, when you're a journalist, when you start, uh, when you're really young, and I started pretty young, uh, people just tell you, okay, you're going to just go there and cover this story, come back, and I want this story by five tonight. As you start um, getting more experienced, and I moved quickly up the ranks, and, and then I was doing more like doc stuff. Eventually, I started choosing what I wanted to do within a framework. So when I was at The Guardian, I became a senior producer, and then they, I think my beat, when we say my beat, is like what I usually cover had to do a lot with social justice and politics. And if we remember at the time, it was sort of like 2014, 2015. This was when, you know, 
uh, the elections were coming up, Trump coming up. There was just a lot of stuff happening, especially in the United States, that was having like international repercussion. And so even though I was asked to do specific things, I got to choose my topics. And so from that point on, because I did a lot of, again, social justice coverage uh, and politics, in my post-journalism life, I mean, I'm still a journalist technically, but I, I, am, I go more towards these stories um, because I think, I think that's the way to move the world is that you have to tell stories where there has been an injustice so it never happens again or it helps change something. You want your work to help change a law or help change mentalities or change the perception so that we all can grow. So when I choose a subject matter, it's usually in that lens. It's how can I, can I pick something that I think moves me and that'll help people see the world differently and allow us to grow collectively. And what do you think about this year's edition of the Algiers International Movie Festival? D did you meet Algerian TV directors, actors, writers? Yeah, it's been extremely interesting to meet um, the creative task force uh, of Algeria. I mean, I haven't met everybody, but I met some beautiful women filmmakers that um, were very interesting and uh, was, were doing uh, pr um, really progressive work. And I, I want to say more even like a... I don't like, I want to use the word radical in a positive way, you know, like breaking barriers. It's, it's always difficult to be a woman making film, first of all, no matter where you are. Even there's a if lot you're, of talent. There's a lot of talent and uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's an opportune time for women to make films, uh, not just in, Alger in Algiers, but everywhere in the world. Everywhere. And so um, it, it's been a privilege to meet other women who are in the same mindset that want to tell stories that want to tell stories that impact women also and and people marginalized people and then I've just been meeting people from all over the world and it's been really interesting so yeah it's been a beautiful experience to be here oh that's beautiful mm -hmm. so Laurence thank you for being with us thank you so much for having me thank you for this sharing with us your beautiful experience thank you so dear, dear viewers thank you for being with us Thank you for watching us. And remember, the beautiful stories happen to the brave souls who have the courage to believe in the beauty of their dreams. See you soon.